Okay, this once okay, recording is started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to BC 213, our course on the end times. Thanks to each of you for connecting to the class today. Let's take a moment just to pray and then we will uh, get started. May I request somebody to please unmute your mic and uh, pray with the class today and then we will start. Anyone could uh, pray with us, please. All right, that's silence here. Avinash, why don't you pray? Uh, sure, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time and the moment that you have given us, Lord Jesus. We praise you this morning, Lord. We worship you this morning, Father God. Mm -hmm. Father God, as we are going to study your word, Father God, in end time, we ask you the more revelation, Father God, to understand your deeper things, Father God, your secret thing, Father God. And as we are going, Father God, we submit Pastor Ashes into your mighty hand in, as he is teaching, Father God. Help us, Father God, to understand his word, Lord Jesus. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, all the fellow fellows where we have father god we ask your grace to understand the things father god we submit this time into your mighty hand lord jesus and we ask this pray in jesus mighty name amen 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 thank you thank you everyone all right so um we are making our journey uh through this chapter that we are calling um a panoramic view that means um they're trying to kind of get a high level overview of the sequence of events. And uh, we're not necessarily going to go into the details. The details we'll get into in our third year uh, when we study the book of Daniel, verse by verse, all the end time prophecies in Daniel. And we also go through Revelation, the book of Revelation, verse by verse. But um, in the course, in this course, uh, our goal is to get an overview of the sequence of events and uh, why we uh, position certain events now uh, where we do. And also we want to look at after this, the next chapter will be the signs of the times, um, um, things that are indicating to us um, where we are and how close we are uh, to the, uh, the, the rapture of the church and so on. Um, like we said earlier, uh, there are differing views on uh, cert on the timing of certain events, or you know how these events would unfold, and we are mindful of that. We are respectful of that. Uh, but uh, when we present uh, our position, uh, we also try to explain why um, uh, why we say that we think you know this is the timing of the event. So I'm going to quickly uh, review what we've done uh, in the last, I think the last two lectures very quickly. And let me start off with something very uh, important, which is the rapture of the church. And uh, we will explain again, so that that itself, you know, like we said, there are different positions on the timing of that event, when it would happen. And uh, so we will present our position and explain why how we believe that is so. So I'm going to go ahead and share the same PDF that we've been using um, on chapter four, Bible prophecy of coming world events, a panoramic view. Uh, we um, have a little chart here that kind of outlines uh, the main, uh, the main uh, events at a, at a very high level. And uh, we, you know, we talked about the rapture of the, uh, the, the event itself, the rapture of the church and what will happen, that we will have uh, glorified bodies when the Lord descends. And we also said that this happens like a thief in the night. So we, we can't predict exactly the day and the hour when the Lord is going to come back uh, for the church. We talked about the trumpet of God. You know, we just looked at the, the, the mention of the trumpet of God, both in First Thessalonians 4 and First Corinthians 15, we talked about those things. And then uh, we just outlined a bullet point 
uh, in a bullet point form what will happen when we are with the Lord in heaven for that seven year period. These are the things the Bible mentions and therefore we are aware of that will take place during that time. And uh, there are just a listing of different crowns that we see uh, mentioned for us in the New Testament. Right, so th that's how far we progressed. So now we are going to talk about um, the rapture of the church and basically give a reason why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, uh, just to uh, repeat, there are different positions. We go back to this little chart here. You know, there are those who believe, uh, so we believe okay, the rapture of the church takes place before the start of the seven years of tribulation. There are some who believe the rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, and uh, we will see uh, as we go, just get an overview of the book of Revelation. Uh, one of their main reasons is because of what we read in Revelation, the 14th chapter. And then there are some who believe the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation. Uh, that was a very historical position, meaning uh, many of the people uh, in the early, you know, historically, the early church fathers um, believed that or positioned that. And uh, uh, so they, they thought it's of the rapture of the church taking place at the end of the tribulation. Some hold on to that as well. Uh, the, the challenge with that is Jesus said, I'll come and receive you to myself. He's talking about mansions. So if it happens here and then we straight away are on the earth, then we don't get a chance to visit our mansions in heaven. And so, you know, that becomes a big question mark as well. But there are some who hold it. So our position is the pre-tribulation. Right? the pre-tribulation, as opposed to the mid-tribulation or the post-tribulation rapture of the church. So why do we believe in a pre-tribulation? Why do we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church? Now, uh, we're going to give uh, certain reasons. I think there are six of these main reasons. But within each of these reasons are additional reasons that are kind of, you know, tied in. So if you break them all down, you could probably list more than six, you could probably list 10 or more reasons. So you know, if you want to itemize them, but I've clubbed, uh, you know, several reasons together under one main heading. So we have like six reasons, but there are actually many sub points in there. And they can, you know, I, if you, if you, if you desire and make it like look like a long list, you can itemize all of them as uh, individual reasons. But Number one, the main or number one and a uh, very important reason we find in Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to ten. Okay, let me just uh, uh, say good morning to everybody. All right, uh, everybody, good morning, welcome. You're all with me so far. What we're going to do today? Uh, we're going to go looking at um, the reason for the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay. Good. Let's uh, get started. Um, let's go. So could somebody read for us Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, please. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. 
for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains until he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Mm. Yeah. All right. It's a very interesting passage because uh, the Apostle Paul is writing, of course, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and he's giving us details. Uh, now, just to keep in mind, remember, this is Paul's second epistle to the Thessalonians. So he has been physically in Thessalonica uh, uh, as part of his missionary journey. So he has spent time ministering to them. And while he was there personally, he has already spoken to them about the end times. He has already told them about the coming of the Lord. Then he has written the first episode, First Thessalonians, where we read in chapter 4 and chapter 5, he's gone into detail to write down, which most likely is already spoken to them when he was there in person, to write down about the rapture of the church, the coming of the Lord, and how the our bodies will be changed, and we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then he continues in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that that coming of the Lord uh, is happens like a thief in the night, meaning we can't predict when that's going to happen. You know, uh, he uses another picture of a woman who goes into labor. So he says, you know, it's 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 unpredictable. We know what's going to happen, but we just don't know when. So our responsibility is to be ready. And we have this assurance that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he states all that in First Thessalonians. Now we are reading Second Thessalonians, where he goes back to that same theme about the coming of the Lord. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, Now, brethren, coming concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So he's speaking up on what he has uh, spoken to them while he was in person and what he has written to them already in his first episode. So the reference point is the rapture, what he has described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So he's talking about that. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, and our gathering together unto him. What is that gathering together? Our bodies are going to be changed in a moment of, uh, in a twinkling of an eye, and we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what he's referring to. That's the reference point. So he says, now, I'm talking to you about that. And verse 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I don't want you to be shaken by, you know, if somebody says, you know, sends you a letter or something saying that nah, this has already happened. You know, so there are a lot of rumors or misinformation being spread even in those days, just like we have <laughs> happening in our day you know, about so many things. You know, so people were spreading all kinds of uh, false information. And so, you know, believers were, some believers were very disturbed, like, hey, did we miss the rapture? Did we miss being gathered together? So Paul is trying to tell them, look, uh, you know, let no one deceive you. That's in verse 3. It's like, don't let anybody fool you, because that day will not come unless certain things happen. I mean, that gathering together with the Lord, that day will not happen unless certain things. So what are the certain things that he's looking for? He says in verse 3, there's going to be a falling away. Uh, there's going to be people who will fall away from the faith. You know, and this is something Paul has written uh, uh, even in other places. Uh, you will find it in uh, you know, First Timothy chapter four, where he um, talks about that. Uh, uh, you know, in latter times, that uh, people will depart from the faith. First Timothy four one, 
I'm, I'm just cross-referencing. Okay, it's not in the notes now. Uh, I'm just going a little off the notes. Uh, uh, he, he mentions, you know, in 1 Timothy 4.1, he says, uh, you know, in the latter times, people will depart from the faith. They'll give heed to seducing spirits and uh, on doctrines of demons. And again, he mentions in the second epistle to Timothy, so second Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, in the last days, uh, perilous times will come, many difficult times will come, and men will be lovers of themselves. Second Timothy chapter 3. He describes the very nature of men, which, you know, uh, it's so much like what we are seeing happen today. Men will be lovers of money and, uh, you know, they will be uh, uh, haters and so on and so forth. Anyway, so that's what he's talking about. Going back to Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, there's the falling away. People are going to be drawn away from the faith. Right? So he says that's one indicator. And even Jesus mentioned that in Matthew 24. He said, you know, one of the signs is what? Uh, uh, there will be many who come to come come saying, I'm Christ, I'm Christ, and they will deceive even the very elect. You know, so deception will be at a high level. People will be departing from the faith. The love of many will be growing cold. That's what Paul is saying here. There's a falling away. Then the, the man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, the lawless one. So he uses different terms to refer to the Antichrist. The man of sin, uh, the lawless, the son of perdition, the lawless one. He has to be revealed. He also has to come into the forefront. And this is the man who is going to sit in the temple of God. This is Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, where he is now referring back to Daniel's prophecies. So Daniel has spoken about this, this uh, little horn, a leader will come. This you'll read about in Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and again in chapter 11. Daniel talks about this, this antichrist who's going to set himself up in the temple of God. He's going to speak boastful things uh, against the you know, against the God of heaven. So Paul is referencing him here in Second Timothy 4. He says, so that's the other thing that has to happen. This uh, lawless one has to be revealed. He has got to come. But, verse 6, there is something that's restraining this lawless one from coming, emerging into visibility. And he who restrains, that's verse 7, has to be taken out of the way. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. And then he jumps to the end of the tribulation, chapter verse 8, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth. That's Revelation chapter 19, which happens at the end of the tribulation. But the lawless one will be in action for seven years. But there is something, verse 7, that is restraining this lawless one, this mystery of lawlessness, this lawless one who's, you know, who's to be revealed, something that's restraining, keeping him from being revealed. And when he who now restrains is taken out of the way, then the lawless one will be revealed. Now, the big question is, who is Paul referring to as he who now restrains? We have two options. It could refer to the church, or it could refer to the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some who believe that verse 7 is referring to the person of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth. But then, if that would be true, then and of course, one of the key verses they would use is from Genesis, uh, I think it's chapter 6, where it says, uh, you know, God says, my spirit will not always strive with the man. Um, this is in Genesis uh, 6 and uh, verse 3. You know, so they use that as a scripture, and I mentioned it as well. They say, okay, in Genesis 6, 3, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. So 2 uh, Thessalonians 2, 7 refers to the 
person of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth, then Antichrist will be revealed. The church will still be here on the earth. Now that's a big problem. Imagine you and me being on the earth without the Holy Spirit. First of all, we would all be spiritually dead because we are born of the Spirit. And Romans 8 says, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This is, a, let me give you the exact verse so you know that uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 8 um, and uh, uh, Verse 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not. So if the Holy Spirit is taken away and the church is left on the earth without the Holy Spirit, what will happen to the church? Would we have any strength at all? First of all, we would not be born again because, you know, without the Holy Spirit, we are dead. We don't belong to Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who is a seal of redemption on our lives. and He is the down payment of our salvation. So imagine the Holy Spirit is taken out of the earth. The church is left here without the Holy Spirit. That's just, you know, unfathomable. We can't think of that. Secondly, uh, as you read through the book of Revelation, you will find that there are many indicators in the book of Revelation that the Holy Spirit is at work on the earth during the tribulation. And I've mentioned some of it, we will go through it. Uh, the, oh, where did I put it? Maybe it comes, oh yeah. Um, you know, so we see, uh, you know, okay, let me, let me go in, in the order of the notes, I'm jumping. With a, uh, on my own. Um, okay, let me. So, so there are those who believe that the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, uh, or that the, the, the He who refers to in verse seven is the Holy Spirit. And uh, but then there are, there's a problem with that. If the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, what will happen? Like I said to the church, and secondly, there are clear indications in the Book of Revelation that the Holy Spirit is at work on the earth during the tribulation, which we will go through. So the only option we have, the only logical conclusion we can come to from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, that the one who's going to be taken out of the way is the church. And this is in keeping with Paul's original thought. What was his original thought in verse 1? He says, the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him. See, that's his original thought, chapter 2, verse 1. So, the he who now restrains, chapter 2, verse 7, we say, when I say we say, I mean I say personally, and I'm sure there will be those who also agree with this, that it refers to the church. Now, there is a problem there because usually in all our minds, when we talk about the church, we think about the bride of Christ, which is feminine. But then that we can resolve very simply because the church is the body of Christ, which is masculine. So it's okay to use a masculine pronoun, the he, to refer to the church. There's nothing wrong with it because the church is the body of Christ, just as it is the bride of Christ. So, and and and, and remember that it's, it's not about the gender. The church has no gender. The church is a, you know, is a it's a body, a spiritual body of believers. So don't, you know, we shouldn't get so fixated with the gender that is used, whether he or she. Uh, there's different, you know, the, the, the different, uh, pictures of the church as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, as the army of God, as a family of God, as uh, the lampstand, as the wine, as the house of prayer, and all very various pictures used for the church. So it's not about the gender. So that itself shouldn't 
compel us to say it's not the church. Okay, so let's look at reasons. Why do we say uh, this is reference to the church? And you know, like each of these points can be highlighted independently, but I've just clubbed them all under this one main point. Now, Jesus clearly stated that the Holy Spirit will remain with us forever. I mean, he will remain with the church. So it is an impossibility for the Holy Spirit to be taken out of the earth and the church left behind. It's an impossibility because Jesus said the Holy Spirit will be with the church forever. Okay, so the Holy Spirit and the church goes, okay. But then, like we said, uh, there are valid reasons in Revelation why the Holy Spirit is still at work on the earth. We will come to that. Second reason why uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 refers to the church is because, like I said, the original thought is our gathering together unto him. That's what the context of what Paul is writing about. And so it's just very logical that verse 7 refers to our gathering together to him. That is the church is gathering together to meet the Lord. The third is the church is called salt and light, which is a very, very clear picture of having a, a preser preserving and a preventive effect on the earth, salt and light, which is, you know, so the church is the restraining one here because it's salt, it's light. And when the salt and light's taken out, then the lawless one, the man of sin, the son of perdition uh, is manifested. So this one I've already explained here that it's okay to use a masculine pronoun to refer to the church because the church is also referred to as the body of Christ. Right? And, you know, like I mentioned, the Holy Spirit is still at work on the earth through the tribulation. Why do we say that? Now, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. So there's absolutely no problem for the Holy Spirit to be present here on earth during the tribulation while he's also, you know, he's present everywhere. He's God in heaven and he's God all over. And uh, the outpouring of the Spirit continues through the last days, right? In Acts uh, Joel 2 28 in Acts 2. In fact, Joel 2 is right, goes on. It says, you know, uh, uh, when you read the whole passage in Joel 2 28, he talks about, he says, In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he says, You young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Upon my servants and my handmaidens will I pour out my spirit. And then he immediately jumps to the signs and the wonders in heaven, which are all about things that will happen during. The tribulation, and I will show signs in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So during this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there are going to be signs in heaven above and on the earth beneath, which is very descriptive of the tribulation. The sun will be turned into darkness, so the moon into blood red. You see all of that in the book of Revelation, which means the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is continuing throughout the tribulation till the very last hour. Of the tribulation. So that's why the whole outpouring of the Holy Spirit continues. Another important reason is because we will see in Revelation 7 that there are 144,000 Jews who are sealed by God. And uh, the seal of God can be interpreted in the context of the New Testament only as two things. It is the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit and it is the name of the Lord. So um, these 144,000 Jews will have the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is clearly referred to as the seal of God, and the name of God. So they're carriers of the name of the Lord. As New Testament believers, you and I have the same thing. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the name of Jesus. These 144,000 Jews will have the seal, the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the name of the Lord on their lives. They'll be bearing the name of Jesus Christ throughout the whole earth. During the tribulation, there will be people who are saved and who will turn to the Lord. Going back to Joel's prophecy, it says, it, Joel's prophecy ends like this, and whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, Peter repeats that. So during the 
out, outpour of the Holy Spirit. During the time when the sun is turned to darkness and the moon to blood red, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So during the tribulation, people will be saved. And you see in Revelation 6, Revelation 7, Revelation 15, Revelation 20, there are those who are being saved and are turning to the Lord during the tribulation. And people cannot be saved apart from the Holy Spirit. There's no other way. Because we are born of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has to be at work to empower these people. And uh, 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 yeah, Revelation 12, it talks about uh, the specifically about the Jewish believers. It says the dragon, Satan, he went to make war after the her offspring, that is the Jewish believers. And they keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is Revelation 12, 17. And what is this phrase, testimony of Jesus Christ? It's referring to the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19, 10. So for these Jews, they will keep the commandments of God and believe in Jesus Christ. That testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's the Holy Spirit who is at work uh, for to save these Jewish people. And that's right there in the middle of the tribulation, Revelation 12. And the last thing we see uh, to prove that the Holy Spirit will be at work during the tribulation is in Zechariah 12, 8 to 10. When the Lord returns, and this is on the Battle of Armageddon very clearly, those who pierced him will see him. That's the Jewish people. And they will mourn, but God will pour out his spirit of grace and supplication upon them. This is clearly the Holy Spirit. And this is happening right there at the end of the tribulation. So for all of these reasons, I don't know how many reasons, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe, six reasons here, sub-reasons, we say very clearly, Holy Spirit is going to be at work on the earth during the tribulation. And the one who's restraining the Antichrist from coming forth is the church. And when the church has done its job of bringing the gospel to the nations, it will be taken out of the way. And then the man of sin, the lawless one, the son of perdition will come forth. So this is a very clear and compelling reason why we say the rapture will take place before the tribulation. Okay, so let me pause here and take any questions on the first point. Um, uh, Rupa, is that, um, sorry, is that a question or uh, I see your comment. Sir, it was in the beginning when you have asked, I understood after you have explained. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay, no problem. Uh, any questions on this first point from Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one to ten? Uh, did everybody get it? Maybe everyone's raptured. No. <laughs> Okay, you got it. Okay. All right. So just imagine if I'm doing class and then we get raptured. I won't even know if you're not there. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So this is one reason. And it's a, I think it's a very, very mm, uh, compelling reason that, uh, uh, you know, the church is taken out of the way and then the lawless one is revealed, right? That is the Antichrist is revealed, okay? So that's just, that's the first reason. Let's just look at the other reasons. Let's try to finish this quickly. Okay, I got to share my screen. Okay, so that's the reason number one. Reason number two, again, is found in uh, the book of Thessalonians itself, and it's something we had uh, referred to uh, last class, 
where um and we can do this quickly because uh, um uh, uh, we we've seen this so in in his first episode to the Thessalonians sorry Paul uh, as he's as he's writing to them and he's going to write to them in detail about the coming of the Lord which he did in first Thessalonians chapter 4 when he described Christ will descend from heaven and you know uh, our bodies will be transformed and we will meet him in the air he prefixed and suffixed that means there is a pre or an early statement and a post statement this is how we prefix that whole passage about meeting the lord in the air in first thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10 he says we are to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come so we are waiting for jesus for what? So that we can meet him after we go through the wrath, the judgment? No, 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 no. We are waiting for him, the one who's been raised from the dead, because he is going to deliver us from the wrath to come. That means his coming is in order to rescue us, deliver us from the wrath to come. That is in chapter 1. Then in chapter 4, he describes in detail how that coming would be, which we read. And then in chapter 5, he repeats that. He says, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whether we are alive, whether we are alive or we are dead, we are going to live together with him so comfort one another with these words so here again so before talking about the rapture and after talking about the rapture he emphasizes the same point that is the coming of the lord is in order to deliver us from the wrath to come and what is the wrath to come? It's, we can say, look, the whole purpose is he's coming to take us out of the way so that the judgment that is going to be poured out on the earth, we don't have to go through it. We don't have to go through that judgment. He's coming to deliver us. Now, if this wrath to come was only about hell, then he could have just said, look, you believe in Jesus and you die in Jesus, you'll be saved from hell. It's, the, we don't have to worry about his coming. Because anyway, if you die in Christ, you're going to be saved from eternal hell. So this wrath to come cannot refer just to eternal hell because that anyway, we have been saved. So we just die and yeah, we're saved from eternal hell. Die in Christ. I say it But the focus is here on his coming in order to deliver us from the wrath to come. Therefore, it's not just eternal hell that he's referring to, but it's the wrath that will be poured out, or the judgment that the word wrath is old. English word just talking about the judgment of God. So um, the judgment that will be poured out on the earth. So here's a second reason. It's the promise to the church, which is, of course, it's in the letter to the Thessalonians. The same thing you find in the promise to the church in uh, Revelation chapter 3. And uh, as the Lord, you know, so uh, in Revelation chapter 3, we will go give an overview of Revelation. Um, in Revelation chapter 3, and the Lord is speaking to, you know, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, speaking to you know, the seven churches, and to each church he's having a message. And to the church in Philadelphia, so one of the seven churches, he's telling them, 
And to each one, he's promising them a reward. And when you look at this church, he says, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no man may take your crown. Now, what did he say? I will keep you from. So the word from in the Greek simply means out of, not as opposed to going through. So if he says, I will keep you as you go through, he would have used the word dear. But he says, I'm keeping you from, I'm out of, ek, right? So I will keep you from, I'll take you out of this. Out of what? The hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, so we don't know for sure, okay, what's he referring to? The hour of trial. The only key we can go by is two things. One is, it's something that comes upon the whole world, meaning it's, a, it's something that affects everybody. So he's not talking about some local trouble. Okay, there will be persecution in your area, and I'll preserve you from that. He's not talking about something local. He's talking about something that's going to affect the whole world. He's going to, I'm keeping you, I'm going to keep you from that. It's going to affect everybody who dwell on the earth. So that's the key. And the second one is, it has to do with his coming. I am coming quickly. So when you put these two together, if he had just said, look, you know, uh, it's going to come on everybody. Uh, so just stay, you know, don't worry, I'll take you out. Uh, I'll just take you out. That's one thing. But when it's put in context with his coming, then we can understand that his keeping us from what's going to come on the whole world has to do with his coming. I'm coming quickly to take you out of this, this, this trial that's going to affect everybody. And the only thing that we are aware of, which is going to affect the whole world, is the tribulation. As you will see in Revelation. It's, it's a global thing, worldwide. It, it, it will be felt worldwide, people will be affected. Quickly, uh, the other one is the exhortation and typology used in Matthew 24. That means when you, and we've gone through this, in Matthew 24, you look at, you know, Jesus' whole description of the end times, you know, the disciples asked him, Lord, what will be the signs of your coming? And then he goes through the signs. And you can trace it very clearly that there is the first part, which are the signs leading up to the tribulation. Then there is the part that deals with the tribulation. And there's a part that deals with the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. And then he goes into exhorting, so just be ready. You know, you don't know when this will happen. So the general exhortation. But in this discourse of the end times, very interesting is, Jesus says that uh, in Matthew 24, 15, when he starts talking about the beginning of the end, he says, as, so he says, of that day and hour, no one knows. But as the days of Noah, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So he's giving us a clue here. He's saying, look, all of this, there is some, uh, some parallel or some similarity 
with what happened during Nova's time. So that's the clue he's giving us of how things will play out. He says, as the days of Nova, that's how it's going to be about the coming of the Son of Man. In the days of Noah, they were eating, drink, all they're all you know busy with things. What happened? People entered the ark. The people who were ready. The ark shut, judgment was poured out. Then the ark opened and these people came. So he says that's how it's going to be. In other words, there's some similarity. So we have to kind of draw the parallel. Oh, people are eating and drinking. The rapture takes place. The ark is the rapture, the place of safety. We are taken away. The church is taken away. Judgment is poured out on the earth. Then, when that is over, we come back to the earth. So that's the parallel. So that's the typology. So it's not like every detail, you know, okay, only two believers will go in, uh, you know, and it, that don't get into those details and that's absurd. But the picture that's painted, the parallel or the typology that is given is, people are enjoying life. They're oblivious to what's gonna happen. But those who already get into a place of safety, they're taken out of the place of judgment. Judgment happens, judgment is over then the people are released back. And that's a powerful picture of the rapture of the church, of the church being taken out of the way and released back to the earth after the tribulation. Number five, let me try to cover this one. Okay, um, I think we'll do this right after the break uh, because I need to explain this a bit. Uh, let me pause here and see if uh, everybody's following with me. Uh, Okay, uh, okay, let me take up this question I see in the chat. Uh, um, yeah, Elisha said, what role will the Holy Spirit play in the salvation of those who call on the name of the Lord in the tribulation? So the Holy Spirit will do everything that he is doing right now in the church through believers during the tribulation. People will be saved. They will speak in tongues. They will have visions, dreams, and prophecies, everything. You know, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 talks about it, everything. There will be signs, wonders, and miracles done through the believers, uh, which we know, um, especially in the second half of the tribulation, there'll be the two witnesses. And they will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do miraculous signs, wonders, and miracles. So everything the Holy Spirit is doing through the church today will continue through believers in and during the tribulation, except that it'll be very hard, very difficult to be a believer and you'll be persecuted and killed. Okay, so the work of the Holy Spirit will continue, but we say it's the end of the church age because the church is officially taken out of the way, but they will be believers, but they will be empowered with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will empower them. Right. It's going to be difficult, but we see this happening. And many of them will be martyred, will be killed um, during the tribulation. Shrikumar, your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, um, as we discussed that, um, you know, um, as uh, Jesus has said this word in the revelation, uh, even in the revelation also, that um, that I will uh, take you out from that wrath or that tribulation. Uh, even last week also I asked this question that uh, uh, is it that um, any any believer can be, is it possible that believers can be left behind? I need a, a little, uh, I have a small doubt on that again because of uh, Matthew 25 which says about 10 virgins where the uh, five were could able to uh, meet the uh, bridegroom and um, others five were left behind so how can um i can i understand this this parable uh like um you know the on the understanding of that every believers will be taken uh but uh, there will be no left left behind 
Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. That goes to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So Jesus gave us uh, several parables in the context of the end times. So essentially from the latter part of Matthew chapter 24 through Matthew chapter 25, uh, he's giving us several different parables in connection to the uh, end times. So he draws the parable about, and, 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 and the intent, the intent of each of these is simply this, be ready and be faithful. So he talks about a householder, a man who's put in charge of the house. You know, this is in Matthew 24. You know, take care of your house, be ready because you don't know when the master is coming back, but he's put you in charge. So be ready, be faithful. Then he talks about these 10 virgins. And again, the, the intent of it is be ready, be faithful. Because you don't know when the bridegroom is coming. And so he's using the picture of these 10 virgins where it was the unpreparedness of five of them they caused them to be left behind. And that means they were not ready for the coming of the Lord. So, what I want to say is, the intent is readiness and faithfulness. Now, can we take that to say um, that there would be some believe to take that to mean to say that there would be some believers who would be left behind. Uh, my big question is, you know, how we define a believer. I think that's where the difference is. If a person is genuinely a believer and living the way a believer should live, uh, meaning they are, of course, handling their responsibilities on earth, but they're living in a state of readiness and being faithful, they will not be left behind. So that's which is, which, which is what a, a believer should be doing. Whereas if there are people who may hear the gospel, they may even attend church, you know, as as a ritual or as a social thing or as a, but they're really not believers. They're not born again. They haven't committed to the themselves to the Lord. Then obviously, you know, they're going to be left behind because even though they heard the gospel, they were, they just didn't respond to it. Could there be, so the question is, could there be people who have been born again, but would be left behind. That's a little difficult to answer because it really depends on, you know, how God, how the Lord is going to look at them. Because if they are born again, they are saved and they love Jesus. Now maybe uh, They may not be living very much like a Christian or so on and so forth. You know, that, what I would say is we will let the Lord handle that because otherwise we would be passing judgment on people that we really don't have any right to. Our goal is, of course, to bring people to a place of uh, faithfulness and preparedness and, you know, uh, living with undivided focus on the Lord. That's our goal as ministers. But um, to, you know, to pass a judgment saying, look, if you don't meet this particular sign, if you don't cross this line here, you will get left behind. That's a little dangerous thing to do, you know, for us as people. I and mean, we should let the Lord decide on that. So, 
if you ask the question, is it possible? The answer will be yes. But what is the line? Let the Lord decide, you know. Uh, I don't want to say, well, you know, if you go look on a temperature scale of zero to 10, if, the, if you're at three, you'll get left behind. And if you're at four, you cross the line. Um, we shouldn't say that, just leave it to the Lord. Uh, yeah. So maybe, uh, okay, if you want, want a just clear and direct answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Clear and direct answer is yes, <laughs> you know. Uh, but where is the line? What is the temperature? I don't know, and you know, we shouldn't judge, right? I'll just leave it to the Lord. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see there's a, there's a question there from Elisha. So what we will do is this, we will go for our break. Uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes. We'll take up the question from Elisha and any other questions on, you know, what we've covered so far, and then we will move forward with other reasons on, uh, uh, on why we believe in the rapture of the church before the tribulation, okay? So see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 